So the question is, why, don't, why do people pursue rewards that don't produce this resonance? They don't have a value hierarchy. So Pleasure Island, it's a good example. Those kids that were brought there were lost. So they didn't, they didn't have anywhere to go, they didn't have an identity. So they default to local pleasure. And that's better than none. Although the problem with local pleasure, well, as the narrative made clear, is that you better look out if you're impulsive because it's going to kick back on you hard. And the reason is, you're only considering the immediate time frame. And the problem is, is that things propagate across all the time frames. And so just because something works really well this second, cocaine, for example, doesn't mean that it's a tenable solution to the class of all problems. So usually, often, people pursue local pleasure because that's the best they can imagine, it's the best they've been taught, they don't see another alternative, so it could be ignorance, it can be they don't want to adopt the responsibility, because part of the problem with working at every level of the hierarchy simultaneously is that it's, it's well, it's like dancing to a very complex waltz, let's say. You have to be paying attention to a very large number of things simultaneously and doing things right. It requires responsibility. And so, you know, that's... It's a pain. It's a weight. Part of the reason people drink alcohol is to get rid of their responsibility. I mean, that's, you know, you hear people drink because they have problems. It's like, yeah, yeah, no. Some people drink because they're anxious and alcoholics drink because they're in withdrawal. But young people drink because they're sick and tired of being responsible, because it's annoying. It's like, so I'll drink enough, I won't care about the medium to long-term consequences, because alcohol, that's exactly what alcohol does. It doesn't make you ignorant of the medium to long-term consequences, but it makes you not care about them. And partly it's because it dampens anxiety. So it dampens anxiety, leaves your positive emotion circuits intact, so then you can go out there and do stupid fun things, and that's like, that's a party really, let's go do stupid fun things, that's a party. But the medium to learn long-term consequences are, it's risky. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but it's risky. So yeah, they don't know better. That's the answer, I would say. This is the Peter Pan story, roughly speaking, is Peter Pan is this magical boy Pan means, Pan is the god of everything, roughly speaking, right? And so it's not an accident that he has the name Pan. And he's the boy that won't grow up. And he's magical. Well, that's because children are magical. They can be anything. They're nothing but potential. And Peter Pan doesn't want to give that up. Why? Well, he's got some adults around him, but the main adult is Captain Hook. Well, who the hell wants to grow up to be Captain Hook? First of all, you've got a hook. Second, you're a tyrant. And third, you're chased by the dragon of chaos with a clock in its stomach, right? The crocodile, it's already got a piece of you. Well, that's what happens when you get older. Time has already got a piece of you. And eventually it's got a taste for you. And eventually it's going to eat you. And so Hook is so traumatized by that that he can't help but be a tyrant. And then Peter Pan looks at traumatized Hook and says, well, no, I'm not sacrificing my childhood for that. So that's fine, except he ends up king of the Lost Boys. In Neverland, well, Neverland doesn't exist, and who the hell wants to be king of the Lost Boys? And he also sacrifices the possibility that he'll have a real relationship with a woman, because that's Wendy, right? And she's kind of conservative, middle-class, London-dwelling girl. She wants to grow up and have kids and have a life. She accepts her mortality, she accepts her maturity. Peter Pan has to content himself with Tinkerbell. She doesn't even exist. She's like, she's like the fairy of porn. She doesn't exist. She's the substitute for the real thing. And so, but the dichotomy that you're talking about is very tricky because there's a sacrificial element in maturation, right? You have to sacrifice the pluripotentiality of childhood for the actuality of a frame. And the question is, well, why would you do that? Well, one reason is, it happens to you whether you do it or not. You can either choose your damn limitation, or you can let it take you unaware when you're 30, or even worse, when you're 40. And then that is not a happy day. And you see, I see people like this, and I think it's more and more common in our culture, because people can put off mat maturity 
without suffering an immediate penalty. But all that happens is the penalty accrues, and then when it finally hits, it just wallops you. Because when you're 25, you can be an idiot. It's no problem. Even when you're out in a job search, it's like, well, you don't have any experience and you're kind of clueless. It's, yeah, yeah, you're young, you know, it's no problem. We can, that's what young people are like, but they're full of potential. Okay, well, now you're the same person at 30. It's like, people aren't so thrilled about you at that point. It's like, what the hell have you been doing for the last 10 years? Well, I'm just as clueless as I was when I was 22. It's, yeah, but you're not 22. You're an old infant, right? And that's an ugly thing, an old infant. So, the, the re part of the reason you choose your damn sacrifice, because the sacrifice is inevitable, but at least you get to choose it. And then there's a, something that's, that's even more complex than that in some sense is that the problem with being a child is that all you are is potential and it's really low resolution. You could be anything, but you're not anything. So then you go and you adopt an apprenticeship, roughly speaking, and then you become, at least you become something. And when you're something, that makes the world open up to you again. You know, like if you're a really good plumber, then you end up being far more than a plumber, right? You end up being a good employer. Not, not that plumbers, I'm not putting plumbers down. It's like more power to plumbers. They've saved more lives than doctors. So, hygiene, right? So, you know, if you're a really good plumber, well, then you have some employees, you run a business, you, 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 make, you, you train some other people, you enlarge their lives, you're kind of a pillar of the community, you, you have your family. It's, you can, once you pass through that narrow training period, which narrows you and constricts you and develops you at the same time, then you can come out the other end with a bunch of new possibility at, hell, at hand. And Jung talked about that. He thought that the proper part of the proper path of development in the last half of life was to rediscover the child that you left behind as you were apprenticing. And so then you get to be something and regain that potential at the same time. Very, very smart. Well, he was very, very smart. So that's very wise, very wise thing to know. So. Sacrifice. We'll, we'll talk more about that too. You get to pick your damn sacrifice. That's all. You don't get to not make one. So you're sacrificial whether you want to be or not. That's a good thing to know as well. So even though it's rather, you know, it's a rough thing to figure out. I think universities facilitate it. Because you can go to university to not be something instead of going to university to be something. And, and that's, it's Pleasure Island. And the price you pay for it, especially in the US, is debt. And you're enticed into it because the administrators can pick your pocket. So they, they rob your future self while allowing you to pretend that you have an identity, right? Very nasty. And you can't declare bankruptcy with your student loans in the US. It's indentured servitude. And it, it is ple it's precisely Pleasure Island, it's exactly that. And so tuition fees have shot way out of control. And part of the reason that universities don't make more demands on their students and let them get away with all the th things they let them get away with is because they're basically, why the hell would you chase them out? They're $100,000 or more. So they can do whatever they want as long as you get to sell them to the salt mines. Right. So, and the, you know, it's not the only reason because the other thing that's happened is that the rate of technological transformation is so fast now and the rate of turnover of things is that it's, it is genuinely harder for people who are say 18 to 20. When I was a kid, roughly speaking, the kind of rough patch for, for, for life was probably 14 to 17, something like that. Now it's, I think it's 18 to 25, something like that. And I, I think the reason for that is, is that all the jobs that the bloody hippies complained about being doomed to in the 1960s have now disappeared. Their problem was, oh my God, I'm going to go have to work for a corporation and get a salary for the rest of my life. You know, and then I'll just end up in it with a pension and that'll be my whole life. It's like, well, it seems like a lot better deal than an endless round of part-time Starbucks jobs. So, you know, some of it is that. It's... It's just, it's, it's, there's a space now in our culture that, that is lacking for people to make that transformation from, from adolescence into adulthood. And so it's just, it's, it's, the cost of that is forestalled. It's not a good thing. 
It's not a good thing.